<clears throat> if the Lord be for us, who can be against us? Let me a second here. We're now reading in the Bibliotheca Sacra, Dr. Sweeney's article on Jesus' promise of the Holy Spirit, which he says made the canon possible, as well as church history and exegetical books. Less than two months later, this promise was fulfilled on the day of Pentecost, or Jewish festival of weeks, Shavuot. The disciples were together in one place, wrote Luke close associate to Paul, who had investigated the sources of his story carefully. And suddenly from heaven there came a sound like a rush of violent wind and filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as of fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each one of them. And they began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Jews from every nation had assembled to Jerusalem to keep the Shavuot in honor of the harvest and according to tradition to commemorate the giving of the law on Mount Sinai. Astounded by this miracle, each one of them heard them speaking in their own language. Peter addressed the throng, now behaving like the rock Jesus had told him he would be, reminding everyone who listened of the prophecy of Joel, then afterwards I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Joel 2.28, he testified that Jesus had arisen from the dead, ascended to the Father, had effected what the prophet had foretold long ago and what Jesus had predicted to them seven weeks earlier. Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God, he preached Jesus, the Messiah, has poured this out upon you. For nearly two millennia, Christian leaders have debated the importance of the sending of the Spirit for their ministries especially the ministry of handing on in the faith. Just what did Jesus mean when he promised the Spirit would guide us into all truth? How much of all truth has been codified in Scripture? How much was revealed after the closing of the canon? Does the Spirit speak outside the leaves of Scripture? If so, how are we to understand what he is saying? Modern liberals have suggested that the Spirit still guides us into truths not seen in the scripture or tradition, and primarily by inspiring the development and spread of our most charitable and liberating global cultural values. Fascinating set of questions. Modern Reformation evangelicals in the Bible and learning to read the scriptures with the fathers by Craig Carter. Within the reformed world, there's a concerted attempt in the early 20th century, led by Gerhardus Voss, to reform biblical theology as an alternative to pre-modern exegesis and dispensationalism appointed to Princeton's first chair in biblical theology in 1894. Voss attempted to reform the discipline of biblical theology that emerged out of the Enlightenment. To understand his effort, we need to go back to 1787 when J.P. Gabler introduced the term biblical theology as an alternative to dogmatic theology. Gabler lived from 1753 to 1826, which he considered to be vitiated by blind adherence to church dogma. Biblical theology, as conceived by Gabler, 
would use historical critical methodology to read the Bible in its historical context, which for Enlightenment scholars like Gabler meant its naturalistic, non-supernatural context. Philosophical naturalism thus replaced church dogma of the ecumenical creeds and Reformation era confessions as the framework in which the Bible was interpreted. This approach led to a cascade of problems. Predictive prophecy is impossible on naturalistic terms. And so many biblical books must be forgeries written after the effect fact. Any consistency of teaching by so many different authors in disparate historical situations is seen as hi historically imposed. The predictions of exile in Deuteronomy it must have been written after the prophets. The idea of Jesus Christ is the Christ must have been read into the Hebrew Bible by the New Testament authors and God's metaphysical attributes derived from Greek philosophy and are read into the Bible. In short, the acids of historical, we should call it decadent criticism, dissolved Christian orthodoxy. In response, Voss proposed the redemptive historical approach to biblical interpretations as an alternative to the kind of biblical theology driven by decadent criticism. Voss and the movement that flowed from him were open to the possibility of miracles and so could do far more justice to the doctrine of biblical inspiration than decadent criticism ever could do. The redemptive historical approach to hermeneutics offered an even more unified understanding of scripture than dispensationalism and was in accord with reformed confessions. Covenant theology drew on post-reformation orthodoxy to develop an account of the unity of the Bible that highlighted consistency between the Testaments using the covenant of grace as a central unifying doctrine. For many today, this approach is totally adequate. Yet, despite its many indubitable strengths, tensions continue to lurk beneath the surface. Notwithstanding the refusal of philosophic naturalism on the use of miracles, Voss's version of biblical theology still tends to reduce the meaning of texts to the single meaning of the human author's intent, intention. And he will advocate for reading the fathers, the Bible with the fathers. Now for Modern Reformation, January, February, 2022. Some book reviews. <clears throat> you are Gods on Nature and Supernature by David Bentley Hart, Notre Dame Press. The relationship between the natural and supernatural, or nature and grace has had a significant place in the periphery of nearly every theological book that David Bentley Hart has written. And I am glad he's finally coming out with a book-length treatment of the topic outside of a few Anglicans and Neo-Calvinists. Contemporary Protestants rarely make use of the categories of the natural and supernatural. But 20th century Catholicism had many rancorous disputes on how to understand these concepts. On one side were the so-called manual Thomists, and on the other those who followed resourcement Thomism, Henry de la Bach. Various movements of the past two decades, however, have revived the dispute. See the works of Lawrence Feingold and Stephen Long. <clears throat> 
in previous writings and discussions on the topic, Hart, in his typically acerbic tone, has made it well known that the revival of a manual Thomist view of nature and supernature is one of the greatest theological travesties of the century. Though debates about nature and supernature may seem pedantic and highly abstract at times, how one conceives of the relation between the two affects nearly every aspect of soteriology. As Hart's previous writings have sketched, his understanding of nature and supernature undergirds his conception of universal salvation as well as how he understands theosis, both of which I am sure he will discuss in this book. Though not everyone appreciates Hart's rhetorical style, to say the least, I find in reading him never a dull moment, even when I find myself holding completely opposite opinions. I have always come away from him having thought through my own views in greater detail done by Noah Friends, a graduate of college, Calvin of philosophy, Westminster, a master of arts, and PhD candidate in the history of history of Christianity at Vanderbilt. Other works reviewed, reformed and evangelical across four centuries, the Presbyterian story in America, Feldmuth, Fortson, Roswell and Stewart. The Trinity on the Nature and Mystery of the One God by Joseph Witt. Calvinism for the Secular Age, 21st Century Lecture, Century Reading of Abraham Kuyper's Lectures, and Church History for Young Readers, Simon Ethicar. We will are near concluding this. Edition. And now we turn to the gamble, Gab Fest in Calvin's Theological Journal with Tony blabbing on about permaculture and eco-theology. And unmercifully, we have another 10 pages of this babble, babble gabbing. They ought to place a high level of responsibility on the individual agents who care for themselves and their community. Give me a second here. They should have a mature understanding of the world exercise through temperate consumption and sharing. These ethics stress the agent's high level of individual and local responsibility. We often think of policy changes and broad applications of techniques such as wind and solar power as being centrally important in addressing environmental issues. Holgram, however, maintains a focus on individual agency because individuals have the power to act upon their surroundings and also to apprehend meaningful difference in their lives on account of individual actions. Furthermore, the lives that we live as individuals and communities impacts the broader world. The design principles. Having considered Holgram's assumptions and ethics, we now consider the design principles which serve as the guide for implementing agency in the face of environmental fragility. There are many, perhaps hundreds of principles in permaculture, but Holmgren consolidates them as 12 principles that organize the key aspects. Number one, observe and interact. Designing a permaculture system happens during interaction with design site, not by preconceived ideas. Respect the site situation and uniqueness soil type, sun angles, water flow, built infrastructures, ideally observe patterns for a year before major changes and implementation. Number two, catch and store energy design systems to collect energy at peak abundance for later use. Water and sun are key examples. 
design houses to collect passive solar for nighttime heat. Modern buildings typically heat and cool entirely through electric and fossil fuel consumption. Goodbye. And now for Dr. Chen's recollection and his discussion of Dr. Richard Gaffin of Fesh Shrift in this magazine. Ten years ago, I started an annual conference on Reformed theology specifically to minister to Chinese church leaders in China. And by God's grace, the number grew to more than 500 attendees per event. God has also blessed this conference with many faithful servants over the years. And Dr. Gaffin has been one of the most frequent in our cast of speakers. The persecuted Church of China has held dearly to the Bible's infallibility, inerrancy, and ultimate source of truth and life. Anyone that teaches in the church in China should be expected to be asked by the locals to show me from the Bible. Dr. Gaffin's style has left the deepest impression on the conference's Chinese church leaders. Year after year, they were amazed at Dr. Gaffin's exegesis, showing them how the Bible, as the word of God, contains all the truths revealed in Christ. Every year when I promoted the conference to the church networks in China, the first question always, will Dr. Gaffin be one of the speakers? I've always asked them why they would specifically like him, and the answer is universal. We want to hear the Bible come alive. One year I had the privilege of inviting Dr. Gaffin to a reform seminary that I started in China. He taught on the Book of Acts. After every class, I had always fellowshiped with the students regarding the impressions left and what they learned. The students reflected they've never realized how exegesis and theology can come alive in the way Dr. Gaffin had managed to demonstrate in class. For these students, hearing his lectures on the Book of Acts is like experiencing the spirit of wisdom and faith being poured on them. It gave them wisdom to understand the truth and encouragement to pursue exegesis and hermeneutics as a medium. Finally, Dr. Gaffin's person and character have left the greatest impression on the Chinese community. At Westminster and on church leaders attending conferences and the students at my seminary, Everyone can see his genuine love, first for God and the Lord Jesus of scriptures and her truth, and finally for God's people within the Chinese community. The truths that Dr. Gaffin taught were not cold but warm. The word of God that Dr. Gaffin spoke to us was solemn but joyful, convicting but hopeful. The churches in Chinese, China always look for someone Christ-like to mimic. And as the Apostle Paul says, mimic me as I mimic Christ. Dr. Gaffin's exegetical approach, theological clarity, and most importantly, the love of Christ naturally flowing out of his life and character have left a great legacy for the Chinese church at large. God has used Dr. Gaffin to continue the Gaffin family's legacy in China. But faithfully and lovingly serving the people of God in this land at different times and different ways. Through Dr. Gaffin, the church in China has received the whole counsel of God faithfully exegeted, preached, and exemplified. Anglican Episcopal History Book Review of the Stuart period, the third section of places made up of three chapters. Clara Jackson from Trinity Hall, Cambridge writes, the latter Stuart church as a natural church in Scotland and Ireland 
This is directly complimented by Jeremy Gregory from Manchester University, providing a broad overview of the late Stuart Church in North America. The third and final contribution in the section is the contribution from Tony Clayton of Bangor University, who has written on the Church of England and the Churches of Europe, 1660 to 1714. The latter comes as something of a surprise to a reader who, following the approaches of the preceding two chapters, might have expected a study on Anglican missions in the continent. Clayton takes a much broader scope by placing Anglicanism in the context of the debates over its place in the spectrum of European Christian churches. Along the way, he throws parallels in the influence of continental thinking in England and the manner in which church nat nationalism gave way to church parties and ecclesiastical politics in England. In the final section on rivals, John Southcombe examines dissent and restoration in the Church of England. And Gabriel Glickman, the Church in the Catholic Community, 1660 to 1714. These two chapters focus on the range of creative tensions and relations between the established Church of England with dissenting Protestants and Catholics. The nine essays in the volume provide a useful summary of recent scholarship that illuminates the range of views surrounding the Church of England in the aftermath of the Civil War, a critical period for the development of the Church of England. Moving on to the next book review, Church and Estate, Religion and Wealth in Industrial Philadelphia by Tom Resnick, Pennsylvania State University Press. In 1886, George P. Roberts, by then the president of the Pennsylvania Railroad, and having inherited a share of the Welsh Trust, that had originally been granted to colonial settlers by William Penn, led efforts to establish a new Episcopal congregation at Bala, Having selected the architect, Roberts proceeded to take great interest and to exercise authority in the building of the church, which was to be renamed and remodeled after a cathedral dedicated to St. Asaph, Asaph, Asaph in ancestral Wales. When he became dissatisfied with the proposed Tiffany windows, Rogers purchased new ones from a London firm favored by English liturgical reformers and Gothic revival architects. We'll continue that, God willing, in our next installment. Westminster Theological Journal. What's in a word? The Trinity by Pierce. Taylor Hibbs, Associate Director of Theological Curriculum and Instruction in Theological English Department at Westminster. Drawing on the linguistic metaphor in John 1.1 1, 1, and the works of Kenneth Pike, Vern Poitras, and John Frame, the author argues that every word in human language has derivative coherence and meaning rooted in the original coherence and meaning of God's communicative behavior. Every word in human language is rooted in two triads, classification, instantiation, association, and grammar, phonology, and reference. Each of these triads is rooted in the Trinity. Thus, every word of human language is revelational of and dependent on the persons of the Godhead for their coherence. Interesting. Literature has a way of drawing out our curiosity. The second scene of Romeo and Juliet, Shakespeare had his leading lady ask a now famous question, what's in a name? 
Juliet was no philosopher of language. She only posed the question because family reputations were getting in the way of romance. Still, the question has drawn attention over the years in linguistics, particularly signification and for good reason. Names can seem purely conventional, yet they are deeply meaningful in their sundry contexts. We might expand Juliet's question to what's in a word. Theologians, I argue, should be especially fascinated by this, for the answer goes back to the very nature of God. This is what I aim to show in this article. Now let me start by saying the question what's in a word is not the same as what is a word. Many philosophers of language have spent years developing an answer to the latter, entailed in the question is a word's meaning. In the 20th century, Wittgenstein, in his later work, suggested that the meaning of a word is its use in language. For Saussure, the meaning of a term is defined by its position in a system of language of which it is a part. A word for most structural linguists was a significant signifier arbitrarily tied to that which is signified. For post-structuralists and deconstructionists, a word was a sign that could only refer to other signs making a labyrinth of signification. For a critique of this movement, see Kevin Van Hoosier, a lamp in the labyrinth, the hermeneutics of aesthetic theology, Trinity Journal. See also Van Hoosier, is their meaning in this text, the Bible, the reader, and morality of literary knowledge. But compare Van Hoosier's approach to that of Vern Poitras in the beginning was the word, a God-centered approach, who notes that the Father is like the signified, the Spirit is like the signifier, and the Son is the word in whom the signified and signifier are eternally united and mutually indwelling. What's in a word is more is a more mysterious question. It moves beyond discussions of signification to address the fact, in fact, who makes a word. What is the raw communicative stuff, for lack of a better term, that gives words semantic value in societal context? What makes it possible for them to reference the world? to strike an audience, to be effective in communication from person to person. The answer to these questions is as terse as it is tantalizing. The Trinity. The Trinity is in every word of human language, upholding it, governing, allowing it to function in all contexts that God himself has ordained for it. Fascinating as we turn to Mid America Theological Journal to discuss Karl Barth's belchings about federal theology, one of which is historicism, which Bart charges against federal theologians is not unrelated, as noted earlier, to what he calls in critiquing the classic reform doctrine of election historical metaphysics, his word. Historical metaphysics means that theologians think themselves able to discern from historical observation who belongs and who doesn't belong within God's circle of salvation in Jesus Christ. Such dis discernment is from here below. But what can we historically assess and determine? Thus, the theological enterprise engaged in this way thinks itself able to discern how humans make the covenant demands now in order to be counted within the circle. This, for Bart, shrinks the narrative of grace down 
from its gospel openness and continual call to all humans to repent and believe. It is prematurely exclusive, not inclusive, and that exclusivity, he believes, is contrary to the New Testament message. Historicism then involves theological affirmations or denials, introducing the nature of God's salvific work from historical observation. That is, what human beings determine from historical information contained in the Bible is reckoned as God's revelation itself. Revelation is thought of and treated statically, a commodity that can be taken up or ignored as one pleases. Bart further argues, as noted above, that this historicism gave way to psychologism, or what we might call a certain form of pietism and subjectivism, or in view of the shriveled scope of God's saving intentions, believers needed to determine whether they met the demands of the covenant sufficiently to be counted among the saved. The net effect of this psychologism was to produce a negative sort of Christianity, judgmental, gloomy, pessimistic, closed off and unfriendly, an unwelcoming and censorious sort of piety. Later, alleges Bart, in hands of modernist theologians, this history of redemption came to reduce all religion to a history of religion or psychologism. For Bart's doctrine of revelation, see his dogmatic secondary literature with several authors here. How should we assess Bart's charge that federal writers succumb to historian, historicism? And in back of that, in as much as they demand, uh, adhere to a Dordian understanding of divine language served up in a kind of historical metaphysics, he will counter his charge. And we have a visitor, so I will have to call this to an end. Godspeed.